Counsel, did you wish to address me? Yeah, Your Honor. I believe the prosecutor filed a memorandum this morning regarding impeachment of this witness. No one can hear you. Oh, I'm sorry. Your Honor, the prosecutor filed a pleading this morning regarding impeachment of this particular witness. Yes. And he has, as I understand it, requested that the defense not mention the fact that this witness has been in the I'll ask. The pornographic website business. May I object, and just ask that the court, the court is aware of the issues. I don't think it's necessary to publish them. That's true. He did. Not in the terms you just stated. For once you want to use, pornographic, when no one else wants to. It was the other way around recently. But what, your point being? Your Honor, we can prove that this witness tried to use tabloid stories about Mr. Jackson. What's your argument against his position? I understand what you can prove. I think his position is well taken. What's your argument? My argument is that what we would like to show, Your Honor, is that he tried to use information allegedly about Mr. Jackson to get into this business. All right. I'll sustain his objection. You cannot impeach him based on the work he did on that. Website? Website after these incidents. All right. Bring in the jury. Go ahead, counsel. Thank you, Your Honor. Mr. Lamarck, where we left off, we were talking about the reasons that you left your employment at Neverland. The reason, there was some problem with Norma Stackos, who was Michael's secretary. What was that problem? She wanted to have my wife to sign an affidavit stating that Bianca had been involved into looking into purses of other maids. And since my wife didn't see it, she didn't want to sign it. When you say Bianca was her name, do you know what her last name was? No, I forgot. Did she have a different first name, do you know? Not that I remember. Okay. And what was this woman Bianca's, what was her job at Neverland? She was the private maid for Michael. She was the only one who could enter his room. So the affidavit that your wife was asked to sign was a false affidavit? Well, it was false as far as my wife was concerned, because she never saw Bianca looking into any purses so. Did she believe that Bianca looked into any purses? No, of course she didn't believe it. Okay. And how much time transpired between the time that your wife was asked to sign this false affidavit and the time that you were asked to leave Neverland? We were. We were not asked, really, to leave, but we had a conference with Norma a few days later, maybe three or four days, and Norma said I guess. Objection. Hearsay. Your Honor. Sustained. Offered to explain conduct only. The question was how much time transpired between the signing of the affidavit, so it's not responsive to the question. That's fine. So let's go back to that first question. How much time between the time that you, that your wife was asked to sign the false affidavit and the time that you actually left your employment at Neverland? I would say four or five days. Okay. Maybe a week. I don't know. And were you terminated from your employment? No, we came into. That's just a, yes, or, no, question. Yes. You were terminated? Nods head up and down. Okay. No. Yes and no. Yes and no. Okay. That's fine. Common agreement. Why do you say, yes and no? Because it was a common agreement that we decided, since we didn't want to sign the affidavit, that was not a place for us to work. Okay. While you were at Neverland during that 10-month period, did you observe Mr. Jackson to have child visitors? Yes. Would these children spend the night at Neverland? Some of them, yes. Would any of them come with families? Yes. Would any of them come by themselves? I think on one occasion I saw. Did you notice whether or not Mr. Jackson would spend time equally with all the child visitors at Neverland? No. Objection. Vague. Sustained. Did Mr. Jackson show any special preference towards the children that visited him at Neverland? Yes. Objection. Leading. Overruled. You may answer. Yes. And was there anything in common that, the children that Mr. Jackson showed preference to, was there anything in common that these children shared? Yes. What was that? 
little boys around 10, 11 years old. How would Mr. Jackson show preference to these 10 or 11 year old boys? He would spend most of his time with them. Would he ever buy them gifts? Yes. Did he buy them more gifts than the other children? Yes. I'm going to object. No foundation. Move to strike. I can ask some additional questions on that. On the question that he objected on. Did he buy them more than any other children? I'll sustain the foundation. Okay. Mr. Lamarck, were you ever asked by Mr. Jackson to go out and buy toys as gifts for these children? Yes. On how many occasions? I don't, several times. Okay. And can you characterize the number of gifts that you would buy, the number of toys? I would go to Toys R Us and pick out toys for boys of 10, 11 years old. Were you instructed to buy such toys? No, but I figured that was what they were for, so. And when you brought these toys to Mr. Jackson, did you have any occasion to see him give these toys as gifts to the children? Well, usually they were put into an area or a tabletop where the kids would come in, you know, tear the papers off and pick up the toys. Did you see Mr. Jackson give more toys to the boys than the other children? Yeah, they were mainly toys for boys. Okay, when Mr. Jackson had these children as guests at Neverland, what type of hours would they keep, in terms of time that they were spending together? Sometimes all day, all night. Was it uncommon for him to stay up all night with the children? Yeah, it was very common. Where did the children sleep? And I'm talking specifically about the 10 or 11 year old boys. Mainly with Michael. Whereabouts? I don't know, because we couldn't get into his apartment, so. But somewhere in his private. In his quarters, yeah. Quarters? Objection. Leading. Well, actually he didn't finish the question. I'll strike the answer and have you rephrase the question. My question was, you said that mainly they would sleep with Michael, and I was asking if that was in his private quarters. Yes. During the time that you were employed at Neverland, did you ever see Michael Jackson sleep with anyone other than children? No. May I approach, your honor? Yes. Mr. Lamarck, I show you people's exhibit number 721. Can you identify that for me, please? Yes. Who is that in that photograph? Macaulay Culkin. Did Macaulay Culkin visit Neverland while you were working there? Yes. Was he a guest of Mr. Jackson's? Yes. Did he spend the night there? Yes. I show you two photographs which I've previously shown to counsel. The first one is People's Exhibit 800. Can you identify that for me, please? Yes, this is the arcade. Okay. And is that a fair representation of the floor plan of the arcade when you were working there? Yeah. Are there some differences in terms of the items that are in this picture? Yes. Than the items that were in the arcade back when you worked there? Yes. What would that be? Some of the artifacts here were not there. And some of the games have been changed. I mean, they were different, a little bit different. But the floor plan is essentially the same? The floor plan is the same, yeah. I show you people's exhibit 801. Same question. Can you identify that for me? That's the arcade also. Different angle. And same distinctions? Yeah. Some of the artifacts have been changed and so forth. The pool table was there. And some of the toy, the games are different. Okay. Ask that people's 800 and 801 be admitted. No objection. Admitted. Mr. Lamarck, at some time during your employment, did you see something involving Mr. Jackson and one of these boys that upset you? Yes. Do you know the name of that boy? Macaulay Culkin. And how long had you worked at Neverland when this incident occurred? Well, I'm not too sure there. I mean, six, seven months maybe. Okay. Where did this incident occur? In the arcade. What was the approximate time of it? Three o'clock in the morning. Three o'clock or four o'clock or something. Three thirty, maybe. What was it that you brought you to the... The arcade is the photos that I just showed you. Yeah. What was it that brought you to the arcade at approximately 3 o'clock in the morning? Well, I was called by the security that Michael wanted some french fries. Okay. So. 
Were you asleep at the time? Yeah. Was that uncommon for you to get a food order in the middle of the night? It happened a few times. Not too often. Okay. Was this a telephone call that you received? Was the, yeah. I mean, we had the, one of those remote control, I mean, phones. Okay. Intercom, or? Yeah. On the radio. Radio? Yeah. Radio. And your instruction was to? Well, yeah. At the time there was always a code for Michael. At the time it was, Silver Fox. So they said that, Silver Fox wants some french fries. Okay. Okay. So. And was there a location you were told to bring these french fries to? Not right away. When they were ready, I just called security again to find out where to deliver the french fries, and I was told to go to the teepee area. Which Michael wasn't there, so I called again, and they said that he probably was in the arcade. Okay. Where was your wife during this time? She was sleeping, home. Okay. So she stayed in bed and you went down to the kitchen and made the french fries? Right. That's correct. And you said you first heard they were at the teepee. Did you go to the teepees? Yeah. And those are teepees located on Neverland? Yeah. They are. On the grounds. And no one was there? No. When did you learn that they, that you were to deliver the french fries to the arcade? Well, at that time I called security and I said, Michael is not there. Where is he? And they told me that he was at the arcade. Did you go to the arcade? Yes. What did you see when you went to the arcade? Michael was playing with Macaulay Culkin at one of the games, which was a thriller, the games. Thriller? Yeah, and he was holding the kid because the kid was small, couldn't reach the controls, so I guess he was holding him with two hands. The kids were up so they could use the controls of the game. And what did you see that upset you? His left hand was inside the pants of the kid. All right. I want you to tell the jury specifically how his hands were configured on the boy's body. Well, his right hand was holding the kid maybe mid-waist, and the left hand was down into the pants. Okay. Now, what type of pants was Macaulay wearing? I forgot what they were. They probably were shorts or something. Were his hands, as far as you could tell, on the inside or the outside of the shorts? They were inside. Were they coming in the shorts from the top or from the bottom? From the bottom. Through one of the legs? Bottom. Which hand was it that he was touching the boy with? Left hand. When you saw this, what did you do? I was shocked, and I almost dropped the french fries. And there was a game there, tip top, and I backed out. Objection. Move to strike. Non-responsive. Denied. As far as the exact location of his hand, could you see where his hand was in the vicinity of Mr. Macaulay's person? Well, it was in the, you know, in the crotch area. The crotch area? And you said they were playing this video game. Did this video game create any sound? Yeah, there was plenty of sound everywhere. I mean, all the machines were on and playing music and making sounds. Do other machines, or did other machines in that video arcade make sounds even though they weren't being played at that time? I think they were. I'm not recalling exactly, but it was very noisy. Okay. Yeah, everything was noisy there. And you said you almost dropped the french fries. What happened next? Then I backed out, and... Backed out the door? The door. Went outside, and I closed the door. And I realized that I still had to deliver the french fries, so then I opened the door. I made a lot of noise to make sure that Michael could hear me coming in. And I said, Michael, your french fries are here. And he said, drop them on this. I forgot where it was, but probably on one of the machine tops. And did you leave? Yes. May I have the Elmo, your honor? Input 4. All right. Mr. Lamarck, I'm showing you People's Exhibit number 800, which you previously identified as a photograph of the arcade. Does this photograph depict in it anywhere the door that you entered that room? Yeah, yes. This one here. Oh, you've got it. Very good. You're ahead of me. Could you indicate again for me the area where it is? I think it's around here somewhere. Or here, I'm sorry. I don't know. Can't see too well, that. Let me show you the photograph. If I may approach, just so you can get a better look at it. I don't know. I think it's, there's a lot of stuff in front of it. It's probably, I'm not sure where it is. It's probably here. 
Okay. Yeah. Right about there? Yeah. All right. I'll show it. Looking at the photograph a little closer, could you identify the area that appears to be the doorway? Right here. Okay. Indicating in the very upper portion of the photograph just off center at the upper edge. All right. So that's the door you entered in. And which direction was it that you were looking when you came in and you saw Mr. Jackson? From here to here. Indicating from the left area of where the door is down to the Yeah. Lower right hand portion of the photograph? Yeah. Here to here. Or here to here someplace. All right. I show you now people's exhibit number 801. Mr. Lamarck, does that show a different perspective? Yes. Of the same area? Yes. Is that an approximate perspective of what you would have seen entering that door? Yes. All right. So tell us, point out for us, if you would, the area where you saw Mr. Jackson and Macaulay Culkin. Somewhere around there. All right. Or maybe. Indicating. Or maybe here. The video game's just to the left of what appears to be an espresso machine. This was not there. Yeah, the espresso machine was not there. No. On the pool table? No, either this, this wasn't there. All right. I think we can have the lights. Mr. Lamarck, did you ever tell this story, or let me back up? After you left Neverland, or at any time during close in time to the period that you saw these events, this event you just described, did you ever report it to any authorities, the police? No. Why not? Because nobody would have ever believed us. And why do you say that? Because Michael was on the top of everything, and if we had come and said to the police, they would have said, what kind of proof do you have? So we couldn't, I mean, this wasn't possible. It would be impossible to give. Did you ever consult an attorney or any other person that might have some background in the law as to what you should do? Yes, and they told us the same thing. At some time after this event occurred, did, were you ever approached by any tabloids? Yes, many. And did you ever sell this story to a tabloid? We talked about it, and we had even some guy trying to sell the story for us, some sleazy guy that tried to make a deal with the tabloid. But at the last minute, we never took in a penny from anyone, because it was against our principles. This sleazy guy that you're talking about. I'm not going to ask you to mention his name, but do you know if he ever profited from your story? Yes, he did. Why do you say that? Because we had an interview with him and our lawyer, Arnold Kessler, and he taped the conversation while it was a private conversation of the lawyer. Okay. And he sold the story to the tabloid and he made some money with that story. Were you tempted yourself to sell your story to the tabloid? Yes, we were tempted for the money, for sure. Everybody would be tempted, but we never did. Did you ultimately tell this story to the police? Yes, we did. They came and interviewed you? Yes. Were you honest with them? Yeah. Thank you. I have no further questions. Cross-examine? Yes, please, your honor. Mr. Lamarck, my name is Tom Mesero and I speak for Mr. Jackson. You signed a statement in September of 1993 about what you had seen, right? If I signed a statement, I forgot when was that, if I sign a statement. Do you remember handwriting a statement about what you claimed you had seen? I don't remember that. Mr. Jackson doing with Mr. Culkin? Remember saying, I could not distinguish what he was really doing with his hand, but you thought it was more than fondling? I don't remember that at all. Would it refresh your recollection if I just show you a copy of the statement? Nods head up and down. May I approach, your honor? Yes. I guess it's correct. Is that your handwriting? Yeah. Is that your signature? Yeah. The date is September 10, 1993, correct? Correct. Do you remember saying you couldn't distinguish what he was really doing with his hand? I don't recall that. But if it's written, that's... It's what you wrote, isn't it? I guess. Well, is it your writing or not? Yes, it is. Okay, and you wrote those words, did you not? I guess I did, but I don't recall. Okay, now, you worked at the Neverland Ranch for how long? Maybe 10 months. Did you ever sue Mr. Jackson? 
No. Not for. We did sue for money he owed us, because Norma Stackos was supposed to pay us overtime, and she never did. And she was supposed to give us some references, good references for other job, and whenever we apply for a job, she never give the references and she never sent us the money. So at that time we sued for the money that was owed to us as overtime. Excuse me, I'm sorry. Did you finish? Yeah. Where did you file your lawsuit against Mr. Jackson? Santa Barbara Court, I think. Did you hire a lawyer in Santa Barbara to do that? Yes. What was the lawyer's name? Forgot. How long did the lawsuit go on? It didn't go on for very long. It settled fairly quickly, did it not? Yes. You got money? Yes. From Mr. Jackson, true? We got money for time, overtime due to us, the time we worked there. You wanted more than that, didn't you? No. Now, you mentioned a sleazy guy was representing you, right? Yeah. His name was? He didn't represent us. He never represented us. You had meetings with him? He was a friend, supposedly a friend. You had meetings with him, correct? Yes, we did. Objection. Argumentative. Overruled. His name was Paul Baresi, correct? That's correct. How did you meet Paul Baresi? It was an old friend that Stella met years ago. And Stella is who? My wife. Do you know how she met Paul Baresi? Objection. Relevance. Sustained. How many times did you meet with Paul Baresi? I can't recall. Several times. And Paul Baresi was in the adult film business, right? Objection. Relevance. Sustained. The court's order. Sustained. You said he was sleazy. Why did you say that to the jury? Because he taped our conversation without our own knowledge while we had a conversation with our own private lawyer, and he sold that story to the tabloid. He was also trying to broker a deal for you with the tabloids, correct? Well, that's what he said. I can get you a deal, because he had a deal himself previously by telling stories about other people. But you had asked him to try and get a deal for you, hadn't you? No, I didn't ask him. He came forwards. But you allowed him to do that, didn't you? Well, we didn't allow him. We said, okay, we'll listen to it, because we were tempted by the money, for sure. Everybody would be tempted, but in the last minute, we didn't do it. When, excuse me, you didn't do it because you found out he had already sold the story and taken the money himself, right? At that time he didn't do that. He didn't sell the story yet. Let me just get this straight. You had discussions with Baresi, right? Uh-huh. You had phone conversations with Baresi, right? Correct. You discussed a price you'd be willing to accept? No, we didn't discuss price with him. Pardon me? We didn't discuss price with him. At one point you discussed the possibility of getting $100,000 with him, didn't you? That's what he said to us, he probably can get $100,000, so we say we are interested. You actually upped it to $500,000, did not you? I don't remember if that was the case, but we were playing the game with him to see how far he could go, because we knew by then he was such a sleazy guy we wanted to see how far he could go. Because we never did it. We never took a penny from anyone. You upped the price to $500 from $100,000 at one point? Yeah, to see if we were going to do it. You couldn't get that kind of money, right? I don't know. We never pursued it. Mr. Baresi, on your behalf, approached a number of newspapers. He didn't work on our behalf, ever. Sir, I have to finish my question. On your behalf, Paul Baresi approached various newspapers and television shows to try and get hundreds of thousands of dollars for you and your wife, right? Objection. Assumes facts not in evidence. That's not true. Overruled. You may answer. Isn't that right? That's not true. It's a complete lie. He was trying to get deals for him, not for us. Didn't you just tell the jury you were playing along with him to see how much you could get? Well, at first, yeah, we were doing. But then we realized the guy was so sleazy, we were not going anywhere with him. So we backed out, and we said, we are not game, and he kept going, doing it. Did you have a discussion with Paul Baresi where you said, we don't want 100,000. We want 500,000. 
Yes or no? Yes. Do you remember having a discussion with Mr. Baresi where you learned the price would be higher if the story was Mr. Jackson's hand was in the clothes rather than outside? That was his own made-up stories, not my story. That statement was made in your discussion with Mr. Baresi, true? I don't recall that, but I think he did it himself. That's what he said we could get if the hands went higher. Okay. Now, did you ever know anyone named Quindoy at Neverland? Objection. Beyond the scope. It fits in with the cross-examination, Your Honor. That's a good response. Laughter. I mean, it's the same. Fits in with what I'm doing. Well, I don't know the answer. I'll allow the question and see how it fits. You and your wife worked at Neverland, right? Correct. Did you ever know a couple named Quindoy that worked at Neverland? No. Ever hear the name? Yes. Had they worked before you? Yes. You learned that the Quindoys were trying to sell a story to the media, right? No, we never. Objection. Relevance. Beyond the scope. Overruled. You may answer. He did answer. The answer was, yes, and then, I'm sorry. The answer was, no, we never. At one point you were trying to sell your story before the Quindoys did, correct? No. Never talked about that with Mr. Baresi? No. Who was the lawyer you retained when it came to dealing with the media? We had a friend. His name was Arnold. Geez. I'm sorry. I have a blank right now. I have a blank with the name. Was his name Kessler? Yes. That's correct. Did he practice law in Los Angeles? Correct. Did you meet with Mr. Kessler? Yes, we did. He is not the lawyer that represented you in your suit against Mr. Jackson, is he? We didn't have a suit against Mr. Jackson. We had a suit against the work, as far as work was concerned. We never sued Mr. Michael Jackson. You sued somebody. We sued the MJ Corporation for overtime. That was Mr. Jackson's company. That's the company, but that's not Mr. Jackson. We didn't sue him. It was Mr. Jackson's company that hired you, wasn't it? Yes, for overtime. Okay, this was after you left your employment, true? That's correct. Okay, you hired attorney Kessler, correct? No, we didn't hire him. He was a friend of ours. We asked him advice. You met with him a number of times about the possibility of selling a story to the media, true? With Baresi. So Baresi was your friend, and Kessler was your friend, correct? Yes, that's correct. And after you met with Kessler, he started calling around trying to sell your story, true? I'm not sure what he was doing. I don't know. I never heard of it. Did you ever learn that he was doing anything to sell your story to anybody? I was. I don't recall, but I think everybody was trying to sell our stories. Everybody else was trying to do that, so? And approximately what year was this? I don't recall. 92 or something. I. When did you leave Neverland? The year? I don't recall. 92, probably, at that time. Whatever. I'm not sure. In 1993, Baresi and Kessler were trying to sell your story, true? I guess they were, but I was not aware of it. But you had many talks with the two of them about that? Yeah, we did earlier. And then we stopped and they kept doing it. I don't know what they were doing. I couldn't keep track of them. Okay. When did you last talk to Kessler? About that time. No, as a matter of fact, I talked to him two days ago because of what happened in the, with what was going on, and I finally find his phone number, and I told him what was going on. And he was very upset about it. He's still your buddy, right? No, we haven't talked since then. Did you talk to him about what you were going to say in court today? No. Did you talk to him about this case? Yeah, I said I was going to be on the stand. Okay, did you call him or did he call you? We called him. You and your wife? My wife did. Okay, were you on the conversation? No. Was it just your wife that talked to him, as far as you know? Yeah. Was she speaking on your behalf? She was just telling him what was going on, that's all. Okay. There was no behalf. There was just chat chat. 
You knew that Mr. Kessler contacted the National Enquirer about your story, right? No, I was not aware of that. You knew he contacted the Globe, right? I was not aware of that either. We contacted them. You knew Inside Edition was contacted, correct? Well, they contacted us directly also. So. How about Splash News Service? No. Okay. When did you last see Macaulay Culkin? At that time, when I was working at the ranch. So you've never really asked him if he was abused, have you? No. You've never heard his side, have you? No. Have you ever learned any time that he denies this event? Objection. Assumes facts. I. Just a moment. He said he's never had any conversation. And foundation. He said he's had no conversation with Mr. Macaulay. The objection is sustained. Okay. Have you followed this case in the media? I don't. You don't follow it at all? I never watch TV, barely. Have you followed this case in the newspaper? I read the newspaper briefly, the highlights, the headlines and so on. But it doesn't interest me. When did you last talk to Mr. Beresi? He called my wife two months ago. Did your wife talk to him? She said, go to hell. I'm not asking you what she said. Laughter. All right. Okay. Do you know, are you aware of him still trying to sell stories on this case? Yeah, he's still doing it. How do you know he's still doing it? Because it's on the Objection. Foundation. Hearsay. The objection is overruled. The question was, how do you know he's still doing it? Pardon me? You may answer that question. How do you? I'm sorry, can you repeat that? Yes. I'll ask the question again. You told the jury Mr. Beresi is still trying to sell stories, right? Yes. How do you know that? My son sent me a copy through the internet two days ago of what was in Splash. Objection. Hearsay. Overruled. Next question. Have you met with any prosecutor to talk about your testimony today, before today? Yes. Who did you meet with? The prosecutor right here. And is that Mr. Auchincloss? Uh-huh. That's correct. When did you meet with him? When? Yes. This morning. And where did you meet? We meet in the witness room. Did he show you any documents? Yes. What documents did he show you? The documents that was shown here on the screen. Now, are you aware of an article appearing in the Globe newspaper on September 21, 1993, that quotes you? No, I never saw it. Never heard about it? Never. Are you aware of that article quoting your wife? No. Okay, so you never heard about that or looked at it, right? No. Okay, no one ever told you about it, right? No, my friends don't read that kind of newspapers. Okay, all right. Before you took the stand today, had you ever heard that you were quoted in an article about Michael Jackson in the Globe newspaper? No. How many times have you been interviewed by anyone with the Sheriff's Department on this case? Just one time in, 93 or something. Just one time? Yeah. Have you had many phone conversations with anybody from the Sheriff's Department about the case? No, not that I recall. Has anyone ever called you on the phone from the prosecution to talk about the case? No, just to tell us that we are going to be in court. That's all. Now, when did you last talk to Norma Stackos? The last day that we left the ranch, Neverland. Did you sue her as well? No. You just sued Mr. Jackson's company, right? We sued Michael just for the overtime that we were owed to us. That's over a seven-month period? Seven months what? I'm sorry, after, after we left in. Yes. I guess. I don't recall. Did you say you hadn't been ever paid for overtime while working at Neverland? That's correct. All right. And was that over a seven-month period or nine-month period? I can't remember. Nine, ten, something like that. Okay. Had you ever made a claim for overtime while you were working? Yes, we did. We settled with Norma at the time we left. She said she was going to give us money for the overtime and give us good references. And we sued when she didn't fill up the part that she said she was going to do. 
You felt she was obligated to give you and your wife a good reference for another job? Why not? What if she didn't think you were competent? Objection. Relevance. She said she would do it. She said she was going to give us a good reference. Just a moment. Just a moment. The objection is sustained. You felt that part of your agreement with Mr. Jackson's company was that if they were contacted by anyone and asked if you were someone you should work with, they had to give you a good recommendation. Is that correct? No. And you never called the police about what you claim Mr. Jackson did to Mr. Culkin, right? That's correct. Now, you indicated you were asked to sign a document saying that a woman named Bianca looked inside someone's purse, right? That's correct. I was not, myself. My wife was. That's Blanca Francia, right? Yeah. Did you know her when she worked at Neverland? Yes. Was she a friend of yours? We didn't have any friends. We couldn't have any friends at the ranch. It was forbidden to be friends with the help. Because everybody was spying on each other, so there was no way to be friends with anyone. The spying was because people were looking for stories to sell, right? No, because I think that's Objection. Argumentative. That's not true. I'll withdraw the objection. Laughter. Are you saying it's your wife that saw Blanca Francia go into someone's purse? She didn't see her doing it. That's why she didn't want to sign it. Okay. Did you ever talk to Blanca Francia about whether or not she did put her hand in someone's purse? Objection. Hearsay. I never did myself. I couldn't hear your objection, counsel. I'll withdraw it. Did you ever ask Blanca Francia if she ever did, in fact, go into someone's purse? No, I never asked myself personally. Did you ever learn that she had admitted doing it? Objection. Argumentative. Assumes facts. It's overruled. You may answer. I'm sorry. Say that again, please. I'll withdraw the question and re-ask it. Did you ever learn that Blanca Francia admitted she had gone into someone's purse? I never heard of anything like this, no. Okay. What hours did you work at Neverland? There was no set hours. It was whenever Michael was in residence or whenever guests were present. And where did you live when you were working at Neverland? At the ranch. I mean, at the Neverland itself, in a private house. Okay. Now, you told the jury that you went to a lawyer and told the lawyer about what you claim you saw in the arcade, right? Correct. Was that while you were working at Neverland? After we left. You didn't go to a lawyer right away to discuss what you had seen, did you? No. Do you know what this particular lawyer specializes in? General practice. Pardon me? General practice. Okay. Had he represented you before? No. He was just a friend. Had he given advice to you before? No. How many meetings did you have with this lawyer about what you claim you saw in the arcade? I think only one time. You had phone conversations with him, did you not? Yes. You had phone conversations about the possibility of selling a story, correct? Objection. Cumulative. Asked and answered. Sustained. Approximately when do you claim you saw Mr. Jackson with Mr. Culkin in the arcade? The time? Approximately, yes. Maybe 3 o'clock, 3 a.m. No, let me rephrase it. It's my mistake. Approximately what month and year do you claim you saw this happen? I don't recall. You continued to work at Neverland after you saw what you claim you saw, right? Yes. Was your wife working at Neverland as well? Yes. You never reported this to anyone there obviously, right? No, we didn't. You never went to Miss Stacco's and said, I saw something improper going on, right? We didn't have to do that. She knew about it. So she was with you watching it? No. You said that Mr. Baresi tape recorded you, right? That's correct. Do you know how many times he did that? I have no idea. Did you ever inquire as to how many times you had been secretly tape recorded by him? No, I didn't. Did you ever ask him? I didn't even know he did it until a few days ago. Who told you he did it? Well, we heard about it from the news and all that, and this information came out, and so that's how we find out. 
I thought you didn't follow the news about the case. Objection. Argumentative. Sustained. Do you have any idea how many times you've been quoted in any tabloid about Michael Jackson? I have no idea. Objection. Relevance. The answer was, I have no idea. I'll allow the question. Would you agree that with time, your story about what you say Mr. Jackson did has changed? I don't think so. When you wrote that handwritten statement that I showed you which had your signature and handwriting, were you being truthful? I don't recall writing this at all, so I have no recollection of that. But you did admit that is your handwriting and signature, true? Looks like my handwriting. Is it your signature? Yes. Isn't it true, Mr. Lamarck, that in 1993, you waited till you were out of personal bankruptcy to start selling the story? My personal bankruptcy was about 18, 19, 20 years ago. Had nothing to do with this. Did you have any bankruptcy proceeding going on in the 1990s, sir? No, sir. Okay. Never filed a document in that regard, right? No. Never were involved in a Chapter 7 action? I was. 20 years ago. I'm going to object as improper impeachment. Sustained. I have no further questions, Your Honor. Just a few questions, Mr. Lamarck. The action that you had against Mr. Jackson for overtime when you left Neverland, did Norma Stackos promise to pay you for your past overtime? She did. When you left Neverland, did she promise to make good references for you in the future? She did. When you left Neverland, did you ever receive the overtime payment that you were due? She never did. Did you go to the California Labor Board to dispute that? Yes, that's where we went. Did you have to litigate it? No, she settled right away. MJJ Productions settled right away? Yeah. Did you get what you felt you were entitled to? Yes, we had the proof that we had worked overtime, so I had a count of all the time we work, so. And as far as Mr. Kessler, was he working for you? Did you ever have to pay him for helping you with this tabloid business? He was a friend. We just asked advice, that's all. So he was just working as a lawyer friend for you? He was, yeah. All right, I'm showing you People's Exhibit number 802. Appears to be a copy of the handwritten note. Is that the note that counsel showed you a few moments ago? Looks the same. Okay. I'd like you to read that over carefully. Take a moment. Just one page. Okay. Okay? Does that represent a fair summation of the facts that you observed in the arcade during that period of time when you observed Macaulay Culkin and the defendant? Yeah. That's basically what I saw. Okay. I'd ask to move 802 into evidence at this time, Your Honor. No objection. It's admitted. And in that account, do you tell? Do you depict that Mr. Jackson's hand is in Mr. Culkin's shorts? That's correct. Thank you. I have no further questions. If you would, does he have the document? Uh-huh. If you would, please take a look at that document and read it to yourself. I did already. All right. Okay. Now, you made two statements, one on September 10, 1993, and one on what looks to be, well, I guess that would be, you make a second statement in the form of a PS, right? Is that made the same day, do you know? Looks the same. You first, there's a signature in the middle of the page. It says, Philip Lamarck, September 10, 1993, correct? Yeah. There's another signature towards the bottom of the page that says, Philip Lamarck, the 10th of September 93, correct? Yeah. You first wrote a statement about what you saw and then you added a PS, correct? Yeah. Let's look at the statement that appears at the beginning, okay? You say that Mr. Jackson had his left hand in the kid's pants, right? Correct. You say, I couldn't distinguish what he was really doing with his hand, but obviously it was more than fondling, right? Uh-huh. You then signed and dated that, true? Correct. I'm going to object if he's just reading part of the statement. I'd ask that the entire statement be read before the signature line. Overruled. You said up top the child was not disturbed by the action, right? Correct. 
You said they were playing a game, correct? Correct. You said the kid was very involved with the game, right? Correct. You said that Michael Jackson was holding Macaulay while he was playing the game, correct? Correct. After you signed and dated that statement, you then chose to add something else, correct? Correct. And what you add was that, his left hand was in his pants under the shorts, left leg, all the way to the crotch, correct? Correct. You added that to what you had said earlier after you had signed your name to what you had said earlier, true? Yeah. And when was this thing actually, when was this statement actually done, do you know? At the same time, it was just an addendum. Clarification. Why did you want an addendum to what you had already written down and signed? I forgot at the time why I did it. I don't have any other recollection of that anyway. You did it because you wanted to sell a story, right? Objection. Argumentative. Absolutely false. I have no further questions. Do you want to withdraw your objection, or? I think so. Sure, why not? Was this document prepared for the police? Yes. All right. And was it prepared after the police interviewed you? Well, it was prepared. I forgot exactly when, if it was at the same time or after. I have no recollection. But the police asked you to write out a statement? A statement of what I saw. Okay. Do you recall if they asked you to put in the details, some more details as far as what you had told them? As much as possible, yes. They wanted more details. Is that why the PS was added, do you know? Yes. All right. Thank you. Nothing further. Obviously this statement was written out after you talked to Mr. Baresi, true? Objection. Vague. I don't think so. I'll object as a vague question as far as time. I don't think so. I'm not sure. Just a moment. You have to wait until I rule. Overruled. Now, read the question back to him. The statement was written. No, the court reporter. Record read. It's probably after, yeah. Do you remember I asked you earlier about that statement, and you told the jury you didn't recall? I have no recollection exactly, that's for sure. But now it's coming back, you know. It's coming back when the prosecutor suggested you wrote it for the police, correct? No, it's coming back. Objection. Argumentative. Objection. Argumentative. All right. Just a moment. You need to wait until the question is completed before you answer. Okay. And just hold on a second so if someone wants to object, they can. And counsel needs to not step on his statements. The court reporter is struggling to keep the record straight. All right. There actually is. The objection was made after he answered, so I'm going to overrule that objection. You may ask your next question. Okay. You now recall that you wrote the statement in September of 1993 in a police interview, right? I'm starting to recall. See, I'm 70 years old this year, and my memory is faltering. Okay. I understand. Have you now fully recollected that you wrote this for the police? It's coming back a little bit, and I think that, yeah. Are you sure? Yeah. Isn't it true you wrote out the statement, you dated and signed it, and somebody wanted you to add something else, so you put in an addendum, and then signed and dated that the same day, right? Objection. Asked and answered. Overruled. You may answer. I don't recall very well when I made this statement, when I wrote it, and I don't recall why there was an addendum added to the statement. Okay. And the statement was written approximately how long after you left Neverland? Whenever the police came, which might be a year after or two years. I don't know. Well, the statement says September 10, 1993. Okay. So. Right? And how long, how much time had elapsed between your leaving Neverland and September 10, 1993, if you know? Probably a year. A little more than a year. And how much time had elapsed between when you saw what you claim you saw in the arcade and September 10, 93? 14 months. 12. 14 months. No further questions. Nothing further. All right. Thank you. You may step down. Call your next witness. 
Your Honor, because of some of the court's rulings this morning, we have no further witnesses at this time. Are you trying to tell the jury they have to go home early today? Unfortunately, I am, Your Honor. I apologize for that from the bottom of my heart. That's the bad news. Laughter. You know, I have some photographs of the wildflowers that I took. Laughter. All right, I can tell you're not interested. We'll release you early today. It's, I think it's been a pretty intense week. It doesn't hurt to get a little time off here. Let me just remind you of the seriousness of your conduct and the admonitions that I've made. The admonitions are that you can't talk to anybody about this case, including each other, your family members, or anybody. You certainly can't go to any place where the events that you hear about testified to occurred or are alleged to have occurred. You are not to listen to or read news accounts or watch TV concerning the case. And, you know, I don't think I should need to remind you of this, but I will, just so that I have a clean conscience. Everybody is watching you, you know. Your behavior, just as my own behavior, is under scrutiny, just as these attorneys' behavior. Everything that happens is reported one way or another. So please be very serious about the responsibility that you've been given here. And having that in mind, I would like you to go out and look at the wildflowers. Laughter. Thank you. And I'm going to stay with the attorneys. There's a couple of issues that we need to take up, but you're free to go. See you Monday at 8.30. And remember, Tuesday afternoon you'll be off, too. Your Honor, can Mr. Jackson depart, or is he? Listen, the audience may leave if they want to. The court is going to take up a couple of motions that have been pending. But anyone in the audience that would like to leave at this time, feel free to do that. Mr. Jackson, if you would like to leave at this time, you may do so. Thank you. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you. Thank you. All right. During the last week or so, there have been some motions that have been pending. We have, the first one is defendant's motion for a mistrial, or, in the alternative, restrictive instructions. I've read and considered the points and authorities. Do you wish to be heard? Just briefly, Your Honor. Now, just because you haven't said anything all week, go ahead. I know it's just been building up and... I'll try to behave myself, Your Honor. All right. The serious matter is, and we did brief it, but it was very brief, because it was an overnight, sort of a pocket thing. Very good brief. The briefer the better, I gather. The point being, though, that the lawyers have to exercise control over the witnesses. They have to admonish the witnesses properly. It is true a witness can do something contrary to the admonitions. This just happened to be a series of witnesses who all seem to have done the same thing with each other, which is call each other either before or after their testimony. And there were two particularly egregious instances of witnesses calling immediately after their testimony was over to discuss their testimony with the upcoming witness, and that was Miss Pilanker calling Mr. Masada, and then Dr. Katz calling Mr. Feldman. And that seemed to be such an egregious breach. There had already been notice of this with the witnesses talking to each other, Dickerman and Katz, and, I'm sorry, Palanker and Masada, and by the time we got to Dr. Katz calling Mr. Feldman, it seemed to me that that was just too much. And anybody who's managing these witnesses and preparing them to come in here should have had a very large shot fired over their bow by virtue of this conduct and should have admonished their witnesses. So I feel that it does taint their testimony when you have two people who are critical witnesses, according to the prosecution, like Dr. Katz and Mr. Feldman, for instance, who are talking about testimony that very seriously impairs the integrity of the process that the court is trying to preserve. And therefore, we feel that a mistrial is the only appropriate remedy. How can the jury otherwise consider this evidence as it should have been presented without being tainted by other witnesses? If the court were to deny that, then we did propose a curative instruction, and we would ask the court to take that action at the very least. Thank you. Who's speaking on behalf of the DA? Judge, we filed a response in written form, and I don't intend to go through it. It's in there. And I'll simply point out that unfortunately if Mr. Sanger, there is nothing in this record that shows that they were talking about their testimony in this case. And particularly in the case of Mrs. Palanker talking to Jamie Masada, it wasn't the subject of the testimony that was the subject of the conversation. 
it was the subject of the behavior of the lawyer that was cross-examining her. And I'd submit to the court there is nothing improper about what these witnesses have done, nor showing that they discussed their testimony. Some of the conversations, the one involved a request from one lawyer to the other as to knowledge of whether or not there had been an attorney-client waiver and that was post-testimonial. It was an after the fact. And it seems to me that certainly one lawyer has a right, when they're both involved in a case, to find out whether there was a waiver or not. I'll submit it on the basis of the other information that we provided to the court from the transcripts and the authorities. The motion for mistrial is denied. The record is clear that there has been some conversation between witnesses. And I've asked counsel, both sides, to admonish their witnesses that, before and after their testimony, unless they're excused, that they are not to discuss, well, what I've admonished is that they are bound by the protective order before their testimony and after, unless they're excused. I don't, in looking at the record, I don't see evidence that they violated the protective order. That exists. The lack of that evidence is that neither side pursued it with any detail as to what the discussions were. But I don't think that would prevent the defense from commenting in their argument, if they wanted to, about the fact that they had been discussing their testimony with each other. And whether or not I'll give a special instruction on that I'll put off until we decide all of our instructions. I'm not leaning in the direction of giving a special instruction in view of the lack of evidence that there was specific conversations about their testimony. But I also am not willing to say I won't give that, and we still have a long way to go in this trial and a lot of witnesses in front of us. So I'll take that issue up on a discussion. Mr. Sanger, on the, on whatever, you may submit the same or different instructions when you submit your final instructions. And that will be my ruling on that. The next item would be the DA's request for mandatory judicial notice of statutes. There's a discussion as to whether or not counsel is prepared on this. Hold on. You don't need to. Unless we're addressing the court, we don't need to have that. You know, I can just cut this short. That's fine. I don't think I'm going to give any instruction on this at this time. Whether or not I'll give it in the final group of instructions will depend on our discussions at that time. Okay. I guess our request is just based upon the fact that there has been numerous questions asked and numerous answers given concerning these areas of the law, and I do think it's important that the jury does ultimately understand the letter of the law, particularly with regard to the recording, the surreptitious recording of conversations, and that it is legal for police officers to surreptitiously record conversations. So I don't mind addressing that when we get into instructions, but we will be making that same motion at that time. You may submit those. I don't think it's a time to give special instructions on that. I do give some instructions as we go along. I don't think these are ones that I would give at this time. And Mr. Sanger, that's, I assume, satisfactory with you? Yes, Your Honor. The motion to prohibit testimony of 1108 witnesses for failure to comply with Penal Code Section 1054.7. Do you wish to address that? Well. I think the court is taking this up now one at a time. I am. And so as long as the court is cognizant of that, I don't think we need a ruling right now. But we are confronted with a number of witnesses for whom we have not received reports until the very last second, and it's causing a problem. It's caused a problem today. All right. The next one is the objection to admission of 1108 and 1101 evidence. And I feel that was adequately argued back when we were arguing about whether or not I would allow the 1108 and 1101 evidence, and I don't see that any new issues have been raised there, so I'll deny that objection. It's made a matter of the record, which is what I think you intended there. In my counting of all the things that were pending that are still out there, that would only leave one thing that's still out there that hasn't been dealt with, which was the supplemental declaration that I'd asked for from Miss Yu which she provided me with, I'm sure she provided you with. This is a matter of statutorily sealed declarations. And I still have, I'm still dealing with that. I'm not prepared to hear anything further on it. And I'm not prepared to make any rulings on it. That's not something I've had time to deal with. But I just wanted everyone to know that I know that's still out there. And then I was going to ask you if there is anything else that I don't have on my list. Judge. The only thing that I have, well, 
The only thing I have is if I could ask the court. Do we have some kind of an update with regard to the computers, the Brad Miller computer and the Evi Tavashi computer? And I say that to the court because I'm estimating that we're getting, not close, but I can see the light at the end of the tunnel with regard to us resting our case, and we'd certainly like to have access to that information before we do. December or January, something like that. I think the light's a little bit brighter than that, Judge. Okay. I wish. You know. The person who's been helping me with that has been Jed. And he doesn't. I have not been updated. So I can't update you. Does counsel have any information? The information that we have is that as of, I would say, weeks ago, if not a month ago. That's off the top of my head. But I believe we provided everything we were requested to provide maybe two months ago. And I think what happened next is he was making additional inquiries based on the particular narrowing of the request by the district attorney, but I have not heard anything further. Do you know what? Judge, I have a little different recollection. Okay. It's not different, it's just maybe updated. As I recall the last time that we talked, they had actually done the, Mr. Roden had actually gone through, I believe it was, I may be confused about this, one of them. He had gone through and actually sorted out what the various types that he thought may or may not be privileged and that those were going to be submitted to the court. And that he was in the process of doing that to the other computer. I don't really need an update today, but if maybe on Monday we could have Mr. Beebe here and get an update with regard to where we stand on that process, that would be helpful, probably, to both sides. We'll do that. That would be fine with me. I just wanted to keep it on the radar screen for you, your honor. I'll ask him about that today, and no later than Monday we'll address it. Thank you. All right, yes? The court has four different SDT returns in the court's possession from Talk America, from Varig Airlines, from Vons, and from Santa Inez High School. I've consulted with Mr. Mesero and Mr. Sanger. We are going to agree that those materials turned over to the court in obedience with those subpoenas can be turned over to the district attorney's office and we will make copies for both of us and immediately return it to the court. Is that your agreement? Yes, your honor. All right, I'll approve that agreement, and you may collect those items. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, then anything else? Your honor, there's also some SDT returns from the defense. Can't hear you. There's some SDT returns from the defense. Just like permission to copy them. They are subpoenas that come within the area that only you are allowed to see? Correct. Your Honor. All right. Had you sought permission to copy them? Is there a problem, or? No. I don't think there's any problem. Just wanted to clarify it and make sure. Okay. Thank you. All right. We'll agree that our copy can be turned over to us under seal. We'll remain silent. Your Honor. Courts in recess.